A common concern I'm seeing lately is high triglyceride levels. My clients are coming to see me and they say, hey, Veronica, my doctor told me that my triglycerides are high and he wants to put me on medication. Is there anything else we can do about it? And so today, that's exactly what we're talking about, what triglycerides are, why they could be high in your body, and what we can do about it. Unfortunately, doctors don't have a lot of time to talk to us about what we can do. If anything, people usually get, oh, you should lose weight or exercise more, eat less, those type of general strategies, which doesn't leave us with a lot of actionable tips in order to really reduce our triglyceride levels. So stay tuned. We'll talk about five ways to reduce triglycerides. If you don't know me, I'm Veronica. I'm the heart dietitian, and I have over 10 years of experience working with individuals living with heart disease, and we use nutrition strategies to help prevent a heart attack or stroke. So if this is interesting to you, make sure you like and subscribe. I upload a new video every week. Okay, so what are triglycerides? Triglycerides are something that's increased in your body when we consume too many calories. Triglycerides are a nice storage form for extra calories. So whether it is protein, whether it's fat, or whether it's carbohydrate, it doesn't matter what type of macronutrient you're consuming in excess. It just matters that you're consuming more calories than you need. When we consume more calories than our, we need, our body says, hey, I don't need these. Let's store them for later. And they're formed in this nice molecule called triglyceride. So one of the common misconceptions I get is that individuals stop eating fat because they are afraid that eating fat will increase their triglyceride levels. And that's not the case. The biggest cause is just increase of calories. So making sure you're eating small meals, small balanced meals throughout the day, and you're not consuming more of the macronutrients than you need. I don't know if you're aware, but there's something called the plate method. And this is a great starting point to give you an idea of how much macronutrients to eat at a meal. You can take any plate, you split it into half. Half of your plate should be vegetables color. That's going to be lots of fiber, antioxidants, vitamins, minerals. And then the other half of your plate, you can split into quarters. One quarter would be your protein and one quarter would be your carbohydrate. And then having about a tablespoon of fat in there is a healthy proportion that your body needs to keep your energy levels stable and fuel your body processes throughout the day. And what happens when you're consuming half your plate carbohydrates or half protein or more, our body only needs that quarter of the plate to be protein or carbohydrates. So the remaining is stored as extra calories for later on. And that was our body's way to protect us, you know, in the hunter-gatherer ages when we were at risk of famine and starvation. They our body was able to store those extra calories just in case that time came for us. Well, in this day and age, we do not have to worry about that, which is, yeah, which we should be thankful for. But in, now instead, we really need to monitor how much of these foods we're consuming so that we don't have this increase of triglyceride levels. So let's start with that. One is the plate method. Let's look at even your lunch yesterday or your dinner yesterday, think about how it compares to the plate method. Was half your plate vegetables? Was a quarter carbohydrate? Was a quarter protein? And if not, how can you change that going forward? So that's strategy one. The next strategy is to watch how much sugar you're consuming through beverages. So a lot of beverages have something called high fructose corn syrup to sweeten them. And high fructose corn syrup is a type of sugar that can increase your blood sugar very, very quickly. And our body doesn't want our blood sugar to spike quickly. We want our blood sugar to go up and down throughout the day, but at a gradual level to keep our, our blood sugar in a certain target throughout the day. Once it gets higher than that, our body shoots into high gear to try to lower it to get back into that range. And how does that happen? 
Well, our pancreas is an organ that secretes a hormone called insulin. It works super, super hard trying to secrete as much insulin as it can to match the sugar that's in our blood because insulin helps to bring the sugar from our blood into our muscle cells to be used as energy. So our pancreas is working hard to secrete insulin and then our liver is also working hard to help bring the sugar down. And that liver is trying to turn that extra sugar into those triglycerides for extra storage later. And in, in doing so, it will help to decrease those sugar levels as well. So trying to reduce foods that are quickly absorbed in our body and increase our blood sugar is a really great strategy to reduce our triglyceride levels. Sometimes when I mention high fructose corn syrup, people automatically link high fructose corn syrup to fructose, which is a type of sugar that's found in fruit. And they're often afraid to eat fruit. But I'm here to tell you that eating fruit won't increase your triglyceride levels. What happens or what the difference between high fructose corn syrup and something like sugar sweetened beverages compared to fruit is that fruit has a nutrient called fiber, right? The fiber is usually found in the skin. Something like berries have lots of skin and it will have lots of fiber as a result. And when sugar and or fructose and fiber are digested in the stomach together, it takes a long time for our stomach to separate the fructose and the fiber, and it slowly moves sugar from our stomach into our bloodstream. So we don't get that spike of sugar that we would see in a sugar-sweetened beverage because there's so much going on in our stomach and it's going slowly into our digestive tract then it can slowly increase our blood sugar at a more stable level that our body can handle. And that's why fruit is different than sugar-sweetened beverages. Okay? So we talked about balance plate. We talked about sugar-sweetened beverages. That could be juice. It could be pop, right? Something that doesn't have a lot of fiber and has a lot of sugar in it. The next thing is processed foods. So processed foods were made because we are busy people. We're busy, we don't have time to cook. So what the food company said is, hey, I can help you. What we can do is we can process foods, we can strip foods of fiber, of nutrients, so that they cook quicker on the stovetop. So you can consume your meals faster. And, you know, cooking doesn't take as long and you can get back to the stuff that matters. So for example, the, if we look at oats, there's a wide range of oats on the market. There's something like instant oatmeal, where it's a package of oats, and all you need to do is pour boiling water over top. And then there's also something called steel-cut oats on the other end. And if you even look at the oat itself, and a steel-cut oat form and a processed oat form, you can see the difference, that there's so much more fiber on that steel-cut oat. The difference in processing is that the oat is just cut with a steel blade for steel cut oats. And then for instant oats on the other end, it's cut a few more times throughout the process. It's rolled and steamed and flattened so that there's more surface area so that when that boiling water hits the oat, it can cook more of it and that's how it cooks quicker. So something like a steel cut oat, when you're cooking it on the stovetop, if you've ever made it before, it takes about 20 to 30 minutes to cook on the stovetop. Whereas the instant oat, it just, you just have to boil water and then it will, you know, cook within a minute. And processing of the two different foods can really impact our blood sugar levels and thus impact our triglycerides. So something like processed oats, the instant oats, we eat them, they're digested in our stomach very quickly because there's not a lot of fiber there. And so it's moved from our stomach into our digestive tract and the sugar is moved from or moved into our bloodstream at a quicker rate. Whereas something like the steel cut oats take a longer time to digest in the stomach. There's lots of fiber and nutrients for your stomach to kind of separate the sugar from the fiber. And then 
slowly moves into the digestive tract, slowly moves into the bloodstream and doesn't increase our blood sugar as much. And just like that, sugar-sweetened beverages that I talked about, then if we eat the steel-cut oats, our body doesn't have to work as hard to get that blood sugar down back into target. So eating the steel-cut oats, especially when we pair it like that plate method, so we pair it with some protein and fat, it won't spike our blood sugar. It keeps our blood sugar in the amount that our body likes and therefore not a lot of triglycerides are formed as a result. So I hope that example makes sense, but that could be any processed food. It doesn't just have to be oats. It could be an example of instant rice compared to brown rice. Um, it could be a I see this a lot, like a protein bar, it's really quick to pull out of your cupboard and consume when you're really hungry, but it's a lot of processed foods in that bar and your blood sugar will likely spike as a result instead of maybe combining some cottage cheese with pumpkin seeds and fruit as a more balanced snack that your body has to digest, but they have similar amounts of protein and nutrients in them. So moving on to the next strategy, and another thing that increases triglyceride levels is alcohol. So alcohol, and it doesn't matter what type of alcohol it is, is basically excess calories, right? There's not a lot of nutrients in there. So what happens? We consume alcohol and our liver has to convert that into a usable form of energy. And so what kind of usable form? likely triglycerides. Remember, triglycerides is just a storage of excess calories. And depending on how much alcohol you're consuming, it could be excess calories, right? So it depends. Some people need to completely cut out alcohol. Other people I've seen just a reduction of alcohol can improve their triglyceride level. So it really depends on you. And then it also depends on what you're mixing the alcohol with. So if you are having something like a hard liquor and you're mixing it with orange juice or pop, that goes back to that sugar-sweetened beverages, uh, how it spikes your blood sugar levels on top of the alcohol being excess calories. So you got a double whammy there. So that's another area that could increase your triglycerides. And then lastly, often when I'm counseling clients who have high triglyceride levels, they also have low HDL cholesterol. Now, HDL cholesterol is something called healthy cholesterol. It's your good cholesterol. We want it to be high. How we increase our HDL is through exercise. So increasing your exercise can also help reduce your triglyceride level because your triglycerides and your HDL get into a better ratio. And that's helpful for your body to manage all your cholesterol molecules in the body. So increasing your exercise can be important. And again, the amount varies by individual and it depends on your diet and your genetics, but starting with at least 30 minutes of exercise every day, and it can be broken down into 10 minute increments would be a really good place to start. That's kind of the general recommendation for individuals is about 150 minutes of exercise a week. And that can be, like I said, broken down into 10 minute chunks. And just as a bonus strategy, if you pair exercise with eating, that can even further help with your blood sugar management, which could then help with triglyceride management as well. So if you eat a meal, most meals, and I do encourage all meals actually to have some carbohydrate in it because our body needs carbohydrate as fuel. So when we eat carbohydrate, it's digested in our body, it increases our blood sugar because all of our muscles and our brain cells need energy or sugar to, to work. So this is a good thing. But sometimes people are insulin resistant, or maybe you have too much carbohydrate or maybe too much sugar and not enough fiber. And all of those things would cause that really heavy or cause that really quick spike of the blood sugar, which we're trying to avoid. So if that spike happens and your body goes into overdrive, trying to bring down that blood sugar. Another way you could help your body try to bring down that blood sugar is through exercise. When we exercise, we're moving our body. We have all of our muscle cells are moving and they're requiring energy to move. 
right? To make, to help our body function. So our muscle cells are looking for sugar and often that 10 minutes of exercise minimum, more the better, but at least 10 minutes of exercise after a meal has been shown to help reduce that blood sugar as well. And then it also puts that stress off of their pancreas to secrete more insulin to bring down your blood sugar and hopefully reduces that liver from taking some of that extra sugar and making little triglyceride molecules for uh, extra storage later. So that's your bonus tip as well. So I hope all those strategies work. If you don't know, I do have a free seven day food guide on my website. So you can sign up for my newsletter. I send out weekly tips about heart disease and ways you can help to manage it through food and nutrition. And if you haven't subscribed yet, I do upload a new video weekly and I'd love to have you around. See you next week.